Hello and welcome to Winning in Prayer TV, Tuesday Night Transformation. I am Pastor Sean Claxton. So glad that you are back with us again as we get into the Word of God, uh, divulge and extract points that will help us to transform our life. So we are glad that you have chosen to join us. Let's say a word of prayer before we begin our Bible study on this evening. We will be talking about trusting the promise. And so, Father God, we thank you for this time that we could come and share your word. We ask that you would rain down fresh wisdom, fresh anointing, oh God, your rhema word that will allow us to live better, to do better, and to take your principles and truths and add it to our life that we will be able to stand for you where you will get glory and honor out of our life. In your name we pray, amen. We are so glad that you are with us again on this evening. And as I said already, our topic this evening, our subject, our, our just piece, our nugget that we are going to take and, uh, and divulge in this evening will be trust the promise or trusting the promise, however you want to do it. If we were to talk about what is trust, many of us want trust. We believe in trust. We need trust in order to move forward in our everyday life. We trust our jobs. We trust our friends and our family. We trust our paycheck that it is going to sustain us. We trust money when we put it into our retirement or into our 401k. We trust those we love. We trust science. We trust uh, psychology. We trust the doctor when the doctor says you have this or we want you to take this. We believe in the medicine that they give us. We trust the legal system, or at least we hope that the legal system is going to protect us. We trust the plane, trains, and automobiles in order to uh, get us from one place to another. But all those things can fail. Even though extensive work may have been done, they may have run all types of tests, but at the end of the day, they were man-made things and anything can happen and those things can fail. Trust is defined as a belief in a reliable, able strength or some in something or someone. So we can have trust and usually if we have trust, it's reliable. We believe it to be the truth. We want it to have the ability and the strength in order to sustain that thing that we are believing on. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody um, and I was thinking on the word promise and as kids, we believed in the pinky promise. So if I said, I promise I'm going to do something, but if we did it, a pinky promise, that meant that it had a little more weight on it and that we were not going to break that promise with that friend, with that situation, with that circumstance. And so we had a promise. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you all were talking and before you said, you said, do you promise? Something as simple as, I'm gonna call you back. And you said, you promise? And you said, yeah, I promise. That meant you can stand sure I'm going to call you back. But have we ever had a promise from God? And when we have a promise from God, we don't have to ask God for pinky promises. We don't have to ask him are you sure you're going to do what you said you're going to do? Because his word stands alone. And it is our job to trust the word, to trust the promise. The Bible has over 7,000 promises that God promises us that he is going to do for us. So like I said, we're going to be talking about trusting the promise. A promise is a declaration that something will or will not happen. It will or will not be given. It will or will not be done. You can, and the person making the promise will go out of their way to make sure that the promise has happened. It's an expressed assurance on an expectation that we have told an individual that we are going to do. In 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, it says, for all the promises of God, in him are yes and amen, that it will work the glory of God through us, trusting God in the promise. Proverbs 3 and 5 said, trust the Lord with all your heart. That means you're giving everything that you have to trust 
him, to rest in him, to go before him, to know that he has the plan. He has everything already mapped out. We don't always have to understand it, but it's God that has it mapped out. Sometimes we trust in our resources, we trust in our abilities, we trust in our family, we trust in our friends, we trust in us more than we trust in God. This, this week, I had a situation and I shared it with the Lord and I knew he already knew, but I think I had finally gotten frustrated and I said, you know what? I no longer trust me to work this situation out. And it wasn't that I was really trying to work it out. I just felt that he had given me the ability to handle it. And so once I said, I no longer trust me, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm just going to let, lay it at your feet. And you give me the strategy to work it out. It felt like within a matter of hours, everything fell right into place. And I was thinking, is that all I had to say? Even though I knew that he was going to work it out, it had me at a place that I had to completely take my hands off, take my mind out of it, trying to work it out. Me and my little infinite, I, I, he is massive. Me and my little small level of thinking thought that I already had everything uh, figured out. And here comes God in a matter of a few minutes and says, and gives an idea, boom, or fixes a situation, boom, or works it out. And you're like, oh, okay, you already have it. And so sometimes we've got to learn to rely, to trust him and to know his promises. The word here in trust means to have confidence. He tells us to put our confidence in no man. Our confidence has to be in God. From the beginning of the day to the end of the day, morning, noon, and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It is our job to have confidence in God. Having confidence means that you have the assurance that he is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask and or think. When we talk about truth, I already stated that truth is the reliability the sh it, to know the strength of something. So when it comes to trusting God, that means we have to believe in his reliability. We have to believe in his word. We have to believe in his ability and in his strength. He can't lie. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to pull back his promises. He's not going to flip up something and decide, you know what? This was a trick. I'm going to do it another way. That's not the God that we serve. So our scripture text today is going to come from Genesis 15. And we know about Abram. We know about Sarah. We know that Abram's desire was to have an heir. We know that Abraham moved faster than what God was moving in his mind because uh, Sarah sent Hagar in and she had, and Abraham ended up having Ishmael. And he was not the, the, the promise that God was going to give Abram. And so in Genesis 15, starting at verse 1, it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign God, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, and Abram, excuse me, said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. In the, verse 1, he told Abram that he was his shield and his great reward. When we rest in God, we get him, which is a great reward. We don't always understand it because we don't understand how God is going to reward us. He will lay it out and say, I am going to do X, Y, and Z. Just like he told Abram, I am going to give you a son. But Abram couldn't see it. He could only look at his, his 
current situation was that I am old. We are old. We are past the area of childbearing. And maybe your situation looks old to you. Maybe you've been there for so long and you've been waiting on God to work out the promise. But remembering that God's timing is not our timing. The way he does things is not the way we do things. The way we see things is not the way that he sees things. And we have to wait on him. We have to rest in him. We have to trust that if he spoke a thing, he is God. He will bring it to pass and that no good thing will he withhold from us. Our job is to walk upright before him. Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to believe and not waver in our faith. Our job is to know that he is able. He is able to do everything that he said that he would do. Uh, Eliezer of, of Damascus uh, phototypes a loyal servant. So Abraham figured, well, I've trained him. He's worked with me. He's been in my house. He has the, the characteristics that I have. He embodies the values that he has learned from me. So therefore, he will be the person that would be my heir. And so Abraham began to tell God, this is what's going to happen. And God came back and said, nope, that is not what is going to happen. And you may be in that place where you doubt it and you figure, God, you're not going to work it out. And I'm going to say, nope, that is not what is going to happen. God is going to work it out. But in the process of him working it out, he is waiting on us. He is doing something on the inside of us. He is continuing to build our trust. So we have to come back, take the word, continue to apply it to our life, continue to listen, continue to uh, pray over what he has placed. And we want to make sure that we hold on to it. We don't let it go. We don't want to stillborn. We don't want to stillbirth. We don't want to abort what has been and we'll abort it if we, if we begin to doubt, if we walk away from it, if we try to fix the situation, which will make it worse. In verse four, it said, then the word of the Lord came to him. If we read the whole thing, if we finish up on three, it says, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Verse four says, then the word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord, people can talk. They can give you their opinions. We can even talk and give ourselves our own opinions. We can surmise. We can try to add it up. We can try to tell ourselves how it's going to work out. We can come up with all type of concoctions and thoughts and visions in our own head. We can try to figure it out. We can come up with our own strategy, but there's nothing like when the word of the Lord speaks. Just like that, it'll put silence in the air. The word of the Lord will trump what everything else, what everyone else says. The word of the Lord will supersede what your own brain thinks, what you have told yourself. The word of the Lord bypasses bloodlines. It bypasses you being motherless. It will bypass you being fatherless. It will bypass you not having children at the time. It will bypass if you're homeless. The word of the Lord will step in. And fix a situation just like that. If you are jobless, the word of the Lord will step in and it will be your comfort. It will be your reassurance. It will be your assurance that God is going to fix. The word of the Lord bypasses time frames and time zones. So it doesn't matter how long you've been waiting. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter how hard you've been working. God will step in in a moment and fix a situation. We have to trust the word of the Lord. That's why it's important that we seek him. That's why it's important that we search for him. That's why it's important that we get on our face and we have time with him because it's his word, not our thoughts, not our words, not other people's words, but it's his word that we need because when he speaks, he can't lie. He doesn't take it back. He's not an Indian giver. He's not going to give you his word and then take his word back. But he stands on his word because his word is true. And his word is sure. And so Abraham knew that he didn't have a question. And so my question to you is today, are you waiting on a promise that God has already told you and you haven't seen it yet? You've got to stay in the place of waiting. You've got to begin to prepare for what God told you was coming to pass. 
You've got to consecrate. You've got to get into his word. Begin to speak the promises of the Lord. As you pray, begin to pray the promises of the Lord. It is just that important. You can't be shook in your faith. You've got to know that our God is faithful. He is just. He is kind. He is sure. And if we rest in him, he, you can best believe that he is working all things out for our good. Don't get rattled when you don't see the promise. Because it's delayed does not mean that it's denied. We hear that often. You have to stand and know that he is going to work it out when the timing is right. And his timing is always right. It may not look like it in our eyes because we can only see what's right in front of us. But our God sees our whole life. And remember, he already told us that before he formed us, he put everything inside of us that he needed. So if you're in an area of waiting, then waiting is where we have to be right now. And we have to trust the waiting process. If you think about a mother who is who has that baby growing inside of her, nine months is a minute to wait. You may get the word today that you're expect you're uh, expecting, excuse me, you're you're expecting, but it takes time to develop. It takes time to grow fingers and toes. It takes time for veins to develop and bones to develop and for them to form. It takes time for the, uh, for your, for the memory to begin to develop because everything that baby is going to need when it comes through that birth canal needs to be on the inside of that child. So it takes time to develop. So while God is developing you to come through the channel, you got to wait and let him develop more muscle in you more brain power. He's strengthening everything on the inside of us. So it's time for us to make sure that we wait. Don't be discouraged in the wait. The promise is going to manifest itself. So we have to trust the promise. In trusting the promise, we've got to position ourselves. We must stay in position. Position is a place or a particular posture of atti or attitude. We can't be angry about the weight. We can't be anxious. He tells us to be anxious for nothing. And sometimes, honestly, in our natural self, that's not always easy. Sometimes it's easy to quote the scripture, but to remind ourselves that I can't be anxious, sometimes we get rattled because we don't see how God is going to work it out. We believe he's going to work it out, but we don't know the steps that he is going to take. And the thing about God, nine times out of 10, he doesn't always work it the way that we think he should work it out. Or if we lay it out. If he, you do it like this, God, and then you do this, and then you do it like this, then it'll all work together. Usually he doesn't do anything like we think. Because we'll work it out from the beginning to the end. And God will work it out from the beginning, from the, from, from the end to the beginning. So we don't get to know how he's going to do it. What we have to trust is that he is going to do it. What is your position during your waiting time? Are you seeking him? Are you fasting? Are you consecrating? Are you asking him to strengthen you? Or are you complaining? Are you angry? Are you disappointed that you even ended up in this situation? Why did God allow this to happen to me? Why? Who are you? I remember asking God that one time, why you let me go through this? <laughs> he was like, who are you, Sean? That you can't. Because after you go through it, after you come out of it, you're able to have a testimony to share with somebody else. Had it not been for the Lord, not just been for him who was on my side. Sometimes we have to go through these, through things. Not sometimes, all the time when we go through these situations, it strengthens us. It gives us that spiritual fortitude. It also gives us a spiritual resume, our spiritual vita, that if I look back over my life and all the things that the Lord has done, we can begin to recall to our mind. Therefore, what? I have hope. Why? Because three years ago when I needed him, he showed up. He didn't come like I wanted him to, but he showed up. Five years ago when I needed him, he showed up. He covered my children. He showed up. He fixed the situation on my job. He showed up. He sustained my mind when I thought it was going to snap. 
when I thought I was going to lose it. Somebody's not where I am. Somebody may be in a mental institution on, on today. Somebody may not be, they may not be operating, but you sustained my mind. What did you do, God? You showed up. And we need to be, we need to be consistent in our belief of knowing that God is going to what? Show up. Why? Because he gave us his promise. He gave us his word. And in his word is everything that we need that is going to sustain us. So what is your position, your posture looking like? If it's out of order, you got to change your posture. Sometimes we have to ask God, God, let me not be a complainer. We're not supposed to complain. We're supposed to be grateful in all things. God, give me, uh, let my let my mind, let my spirit, let my hunger be for you. Let me be grateful for where I am. Thank you. Sometimes it's hard to say thank you in the midst of going through. But thank you. Because instead of seeing this glass half empty, I'm going to see it half full. You are covering me. You are keeping me. You're sustaining me. And so for that, I'm grateful. My posture is going to be one of gratitude. And so we want to make sure that we stay in a place uh, that our posture looks right before him in the right position. Also, we want to run. We want to run the race that is it has been placed before us. That's the part of us trusting the process is we don't quit. We have to keep going. You may have to do a speed walk and you can't run. Maybe you just have to do a light jog, but you have to stay. I remember a supervisor of mine, when I had finished a degree, she told me, she said, Sean, whatever you do, she was asking me if I was going to continue to go to school. And I was like, I am tired. And her words were to me, she said, whatever you do, don't quit. She said, if you can't take three classes, take two. If you can't take two classes, take one. Because she knew that if I were to stop, one semester would be two, two semester would be three. And when you stop doing something that you've been consistently doing, it's hard to start it back up again. You ever been going to the gym? You go for one month, you go for two months, you go for three months, you go for six months, you're consistent. And you go on vacation and come back and you didn't work out the whole vacation. And all of a sudden, you're like, I'm going to go, I got to get to the gym. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Tomorrow ends up three days later. Three days later ends up being two weeks. It ends up being another month. And before you know it, you're trying to drag yourself back. And what happens? The stamina that you had, if you were up to five miles, sometimes you got to back it up to three. Why? Because you got to get yourself back in to the mode of where you were. The training all over again. And who, Hebrews 12 and 1, it says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. We've got to get into the place of continuously running the race. We don't have to understand everything that is going to come because while we are running the race, there are going to be some things that come against us. Our job is to stay consistent in the race. Seeking God in the race. Laying out before him in the race because the race is to get to the finish line. It's not to be number one. It's not to look like the person that's on our left or the person that's on our right or the person that's in front of us or the person that's behind us, but it is to get to the finish line. It is to hear him say, well done. It is to make it in. That's our job is to make it in. So we want to make sure that we run the race that is set before us and we have to throw off everything that hinders us. What's hindering you? from staying in the place of believing the promise. If you have any hindrances, you need to get rid of those things. They may not be sins, but they may be hindering you from moving forward, giving God your all. We have to also outlast all the things that, that we are seeing, that we are feeling. We have to outlast the frustration of the promise not being here. We have to outlast the loneliness because sometimes in the middle of the promise, it, you may feel like, God, it's only me and you. And really, that's what our walk is with him. It's him and us. Sometimes there's nobody there to concur encourage us. So you have to be like David. Take a minute and encourage yourself. Pat your own self. Tell, you know what, girl? You got this. You know what, God? You got this. You and God, we are going to do this. God, I am standing with you and you alone. I don't care what it looks like. I am determined that you and I, we are going to make it through this situation. You have to outlast the negativity. Somebody may be talking and saying, do you really think that is going to come to pass? I sure do. Why? Because God made me a promise. I am standing on his word. 
word. I don't care what it looks like to you. It may look like it is never going to come to pass. We have to even stand against the word curses that said we would never be. We would never do. It's not going to work. We're going to stand on the word of the Lord. Why? Because his word is yes and it is a man. That is where we stand. So we have to outlast negative negativity. We have to outlast walking alone. We have to outlast going through the valley, the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes right in the middle, we feel like we're going to die in the situation before the promise comes. No, ma'am. No, sir. Just like Abram, we have to believe the word of the Lord. We have to also watch over the promise. Sometimes you can't tell everybody what God is telling you. You can't share it with everybody. Sometimes you have to bottle that thing up, write it out, and begin to tell God, I'm believing that you are going to work this thing out. We have to outlast the chatter. Outlast it. Whatever is going on, the chatter on the outside and the chatter also that goes on in our head, the enemy that comes to steal and kill the dream that God has placed down. He's walking to and fro like a lion. That's what the word says. But he also walks trying to discourage us, trying to interrupt, trying to tear down what we, who we are in God and what we believe. We have to outlast that. We have to continue to stand knowing that we are going to, to make it. We also have to maneuver. We have to move. We got to have movement going on. There's the destination that we are trying to get to. We have to wait for the promise and we have to allow the promise to come. Some, we got to walk the promise out. Even when we don't see it, you still have to walk it out. You've got to trust God that God is doing a new thing. He is opening a door. He is making a way. Why? Because that's what he said that he was going to do. There are maneuvers. There are tactical exercises that are carried out in a field by large bodies of troop simulating the conditions of war. So we have to make sure that we have maneuvers that we can step in. And when the enemy comes, we know that God comes in like a shield. He's our protection. He told Abraham, I'm your great reward. If we remember that there is a, a reward with us staying faithful, with us staying true, there's a reward. With us believing, with us recalling God's word to him, there is a reward. God will show up. It is so important that we depend on him. We've got to know, what shoes do you have on while you're running this race? Do you have on combat boots that allow you to do rocky climb? That is something heavy falls on you. It's not going to injure your, it's not going to injure your feet. Do you have the feet like the deer where you're trying to get to the high place? Are you somewhere walking in heels where you can't hardly get there? Sometimes you got to take off and change and get on the right gear. We got to get on the right gear. Do you have the armor of the Lord on so that you can get to the place where you need to get in God? We've got to know where we are going. With all that, that we're doing, we know that he is our very present help in trouble. I don't know what you're trusting him for. Home, job, work, ministry. I don't know, children retirement, making a move, more finances, a better life of witnessing, better prophecy. I don't know what you're trusting him for, but you have got to trust him. Remember that he said that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the light. He comes in to give us light. We grow when we stay in his presence. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weary, heavy laden, he said he would give us rest. Some of us just need to take a moment to rest in his presence. We try to find rest in so many other things, but we need to be resting in the presence of the Lord. When we're tired, we can't hear clear. Oh, but when you rest, God will give you a strategy, and it doesn't take him all day long to give strategy. Sometimes you're trying to figure it out. There used to be some, a song that said, work it out. And I love God because while we're trying to figure it out, we're trying to figure it out. He's already worked it out. And it's our job to get before him because we need his strategy. We need his guidance. We need his direction. Because there's no flaws in his guidance, in his wisdom, and in his direction. 
Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must first believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. What does it mean to be diligent when it comes to seeking him? We got to eagerly seek him. We got to enthusiastically seek him. Get excited about getting in his presence. We come to purposely seek him. I come to seek you for purpose. I come to seek you for guidance. I come to seek you for direction. It's not in me because nothing good dwells in me. Because if you let me do it, I'm going to blow it up. <laughs> I'm going to mess it up, God. I need you to give me the ability to work this thing out. I come to you diligently. I come to you speedily. I come to you fervently. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. I come fervently seeking you desiring your desire for me, wanting what you want for me, trusting that you are working something good in me. So yeah, God, I'm going through. Yes, it feels like my life is messed up right now, but you're working this out for my good. You're going to work this situation out. How are you going to do it? You're going to grow me in this situation. What am I going to gain from this situation? So I come diligently seeking you. I come persistent. I'm persistent every day seeking you for guidance, telling you how wonderful you are, telling you how great you are, telling you that your plans don't fail. You already know that they don't fail, but I'm really praying your word back to you, resting in you, trusting the promise, knowing that you are working all things out for my good, thanking you that you are giving me strength in the midst of this situation. You are letting me know that you are a great God. You are a faithful God. You are a loving God. You are a true God. No weapon formed against me is prospering. Why? Because you are my shield and my great reward. That you are my bridge. If there's some troubled water, you will build a bridge. You'll make a way in the, in, in, the, in the midst of a desert. You will part waters for me to be able to walk through on dry land. When the enemy was right there behind me, he was coming to get me. You're a part of water. You'll make a way. I thought about yesterday. I was driving and I saw this gentleman flying down the street and he was in the other lane and the car that turned in front of him, that car turned, pulled so quickly that I, the only thing I knew was <laughs> He is going to hit him, tear him up, and I was embracing. In some type of way, that other car turned, and he flew in the hole. He shook my car as he went, and immediately I said, thank you, God, for protection, because there was nowhere for me to go. There was a car on the left side. He was coming on the right side, and the other car had turned in front of him and was going way too fast. There is nothing like knowing that he is our very present help in the time of trouble. He protects us when we don't even know that trouble is surrounding us. You better trust the promise. You better trust knowing that he is going to do what he said he would do because he is God in our life. If nothing else, it is our job to remember that he is. He told Abraham, I am. I am. I am. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, you have to be steadfast in this thing. You cannot be wishy-washy. You can't waver. And even when you feel like you are shook, after you are finished being shook, you got to get right back and go right back to the word. And begin to speak those things that be not as though they were. Unmovable, always abounding means to be being filled with something. You are being filled with the word of the Lord. You have got to stay. What have your hands been assigned to do in this season? While you are waiting on the promise, there's something that he's placed in you to do. Are you doing it? Are you working it out? What I am finding out about God, God gives us sometimes, he'll, sometimes he'll give us a whole plan and sometimes he'll give us little tidbits. And as you work the tidbit out, he'll increase it. It's almost like the, the servant that had the 10 talents when he took the talents and then he did what? He had them, then he multiplied them. And that's what God does in our life. He'll give us something to do and you do that, he'll unveil something else. It's like an onion. He'll be, you'll be like, oh, 
he'll give you another piece of the strategy, another piece of the puzzle, and then you walk that out. And while you're walking that out, he's giving you another piece. So it's not for you to get stagnant while you're trying to wait for everything. No, you've got to begin to work and do the work that he has placed in you um, while we are waiting on the promise. The promise comes with provision. It's not your job to understand it all, but it is your job to trust the process. It's not your job to go out and get the provision because he said he would give us everything that we need. So therefore, it's our job to trust him for provision. But we must walk in obedience. Anything other than obedience is disobedience. And he doesn't honor that. So God, help us when we're not walking in obedience. Help us when we're dragging our feet. Help us when we're trying to figure out how you're going to fix it. When we should actually be doing the steps that you placed in front of us. What book? And I have to ask myself, what book has he given you to write? What situation has he given you? What business has he given you to start? What t-shirt line has he given you to start? What, uh, Whether it's a clothing line, I don't know. He's given all of us something. What has he placed in our hands that we're still just holding it in our hands? We still got the baby growing on the inside of us. The baby is ready to be born. And we are still trying to figure out, God, is it the right time? Everybody else is doing something like that. Why do I need to do it? You got umpteen thousand people. He's waiting for you to do what he placed in you because somebody is waiting for you to step in there. Why? Because you will draw them. There's somebody waiting for you. There's somebody waiting for me. And our job is to trust God to do the thing that he has placed in us to do. While we are in this season, giving up, not an option. Laziness, not an option. Disobedience, not an option. Changing the plan is not an option. You don't get to change God's plan. Because what will happen? He will bring you right back full circle. And usually when we deviate from the plan, we, are go we have to go through so many, more, so many hardships. And he'll get us right back to where he, we said, where he said that he wanted for us to be. So in this season, the option is to follow him, to get into alignment with him, to stay faithful before him, and to allow him to work out. Don't quit. You don't get to give up. And even if you get weary, he told us that not to be weary in well-doing for in due season. That's our season. We're looking for due season that we'll reap but we can't faint. If we faint, we don't get to reap the benefit of God. We have to stay faithful. We have to endure. And endurance is a fact or power of sustaining a difficult process or situation without giving it up. You got to maintain the race. You got to stand in it. Sometimes you have to stop and just mock time, but not quit. You got to get your energy and we get it because sometimes we get tired because we are human beings. But we're still having a spiritual experience and God is our strength. We're having a God experience. So we got to make sure that we endure. How can we fight as a good soldier? Fighting as a good soldier means I got to take the word of God and apply it to my life. We've got to be dedicated we got to be so dedicated. we got to be, uh, let the word be durable in our life. Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier. A good soldier stands. All of us didn't go into the military. My father, my mother were both in the military. I got to be an ROTC when I was in high school. And they would make us stand and they took us to a, a, a uh, army base and they took us the whole the whole weekend they allowed us to live on the base and they would wake us up in the middle of the night and they sent us through the gas chamber and they made us repel off the side of the mountain they would take us up and make us get in formation and stay outside all night as a teenager that was hard but I knew that in three or four days I got to go home but sometimes we get into situations we don't know how long we're going to be in there the soldiers when they are when they are training they don't know how long they're going to be but they have to endure why because they have to be willing to to they have to be able to protect at any cost we have to protect the vision that God places on the inside of us at all costs we've got to be strong 
Sometimes casualties happen around us. We still have to be strong and we have to make sure that we can maintain. We must be deliberate about what we are doing. Second Timothy 2 and 4 says, no man that war entangles himself with the affairs of life. We have to make sure that what is going on around us, we don't allow entanglements to happen, to, to snares to happen, tricks to happen that will keep us from getting into the place of God that will delay the promise because of us, not because of him, but because of us. Your promise is coming. You got to trust the promise. Psalms 119 and 50 says, for thy word hath quickened me. He hath me alive or has caused me to be alive. The word of God quickens us. It causes us to stand firm. It causes us to believe. It causes us to know that God is working things out for our good. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22 says, My son, give attention to my words. It's up to us to, to hear the words of God. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who who find them. God's words are our life. That's our lifeline. Not people's words, not the words of our supervisor, not the words that we hear on TV, not the words from everybody else, but the word of God is life. You need life today? Get into his word. Read his word. Let his word seep deep into your heart. That is going to... To, to sustain you. When we think about the promises, they're all throughout scripture. He promised us in Joshua 21 and 45, not one of all of God's good promises of Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. God's promises, they never fail. God is always good. According to Psalms 119 and 68, it says, you are good and you do good. Teach me your statues. We need to know the statues of God. Why? Because they are always good. Hebrews 10 and 23 says, God is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised, he is faithful. I don't know if you have ever been through anything and it seems like everybody else around you is flaking out. God is always faithful. He is kind and he is compassionate. According to Isaiah 54 and 10, though the mountain be shaken, hallelujah, and the hill be removed, yet my unfailing kindness, your love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, saith the Lord, who has compassion on you. He has compassion for us. He is kind and compassionate. God loves me deeply, no matter what. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's how deeply he loves us. Nothing high, nothing low, nothing too wide, nothing too small, nothing too big, nothing too deep can keep his love from coming after me. He gives us power according to 2 Timothy 2, excuse me, 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for the spirit of the Lord gave us, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and it gives us self-discipline or a sound mind. We can trust in God. God always works it out for our good. You may not like it, but it's for our good. I may not like it, but it's for my good. God will give strength and help, Isaiah 41 and 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be, be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. He says that he will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In his right hand is power. So it lets us know that God is going to strengthen me. God will give us wisdom according to James 1 and 5. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God. He gives us generously without fault. 
he will give it to us. You need wisdom? Ask God. God promises you abundant life. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said that he came that we would have life and not just have life, but we would have life more abundantly. We would have life to the fullest. We would have great life. Why? Because we trust in God. Jeremiah 29 and 7 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. We got to trust the plan that God has for us. God can be trusted. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Hebrews 10 and 23. So I don't know what you're going through, but you have got to trust the promises of God. Every promise is yes, and it is amen. When we go back to Psalms, we know that David had many afflictions, but David stood knowing that God would cover him in all of his afflictions. No matter what you're going through, no matter what your situation looks like, no matter what comes up against you, if God gave you a promise, you got to trust the promise. We are to be good soldiers while we are trusting the promise. We may have some fiery darts that are coming after us, coming at us, but our job is to trust the promise. When David was anointed king, he got to go right back out and be in the field. He could have got mad and been like, I'm supposed to be a king. I'm out here with these sheep. No, he had to trust. And even when he came into the palace, he was summoned to come in. He was Saul throwing daggers at him. He still had to trust the promise. And he honored Saul. He honored the king, even though the king was coming after him. Even though things are still coming, you got to know, God, you still got my back. You are still covering me. You are still above, below, to my right, to my left. You are surrounding me. You are keeping me. Why? Because I am standing, believing that you are going to strengthen me while I am trusting and waiting on the promise. Remember that he is our exceeding great reward. It is up to us to stand to go through what God has placed in us to go through. Earlier, I gave you some different things. Remember P, I gave you the word promise. P was for position. Remember, we gotta stay in position. R was for run. We gotta run the race that God has placed before us. O, you have to outlast everything that is coming against you. M is for movement or maneuver. We have to maneuver, but we only get to do that in God. He will give us exactly how to maneuver. I, knowing that I, God, he is our strength giver. He said, I, I am. You got to know that whatever you need him to be, he is. And you have to speak that thing into your life. S, you, get to, you have to be steadfast. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, and E, endure. You have to have endurance for this race. For the race is not given to the swift, nor to the strong, but is it, it is of us, and we will win if we endure to the end. So, Father God, we say thank you that we can stand and trust your word. We can trust your promise. We can know that you are working things out for our good. Thank you for being loving and kind and true and good. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for being our bridge over troubled water. Thank you for being the God that sees, the God that knows. Thank you for being our healer. Thank you for being our banner. Thank you for being the true and the living God. We ask that you continue to cover us and help us to do what you have placed in our hands, oh God. The world needs what we have. Why? Because it is of you. Nothing in us is good, but everything that you place in us brings benefit and it directs glory right back to you. So we want to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. We give you honor and glory. In your son's Jesus name we pray. Amen. Again, we thank you. For joining us on Winning in Prayer TV, Tuesday Night Transformation. We ask that you will join us again next Tuesday. We thank Apostle Daryl and Pastor Tammy for all that they're doing on Winning in Prayer TV. Make sure that you check out the scheduling that we have because we want you to be a part on the, of the movement that God is doing across the globe. Again, Tuesday Night Transformation, I am Pastor Sean Claxton. Many blessings to you and yours.
Are you looking for a place to grow your ministry? Join Winning in Prayer TV Christian Broadcasting on Roku. Your ministry will be shared on social media platforms, streamed on Roku with the reach of 55 million homes. It will be your choice of day and time, professional editing, and a low weekly cost of $25 a week. Contact us today at 941-782-8322 or you can email at Winning in Prayer tv at gmail.com again contact us at 941-782-8322 winning in prayer tv at gmail.com to get more information thank you and hope to hear from you soon